I'm Eddie Alterman, Editor-in-Chief of Car and Driver, and I have with me, hot off the presses, our August issue. We're going to talk about that, and I've got technical editor Eric Tingwell with me and senior editor Jared Gall. We're pretty proud of this one. It's our Tech 50. It's the first time we've done this uh, big roundup of all the, the technical issues of the day. We drive the Porsche 918 Spyder. But let's talk about Jared's section first, which is the upfront section. He edits that, and there's some cool stories in there. So yeah, we start with a look at uh, the proposed transatlantic trade partnership between the U.S. and the European Union. Um, Justin Berkowitz gets into the potential ramifications of that, uh, something that President Obama mentioned in his State of the Union address in March, and it's very early in development, but what it is, it's an endeavor to align the sort of the safety and emissions regulations between Europe and the U.S. on one hand. On the other hand, they're striving to eliminate tariffs between the two countries, or between the two continents, um, to ease the flow of cars back and forth. And I, I mean, the number of potential ramifications um, really, and those just kind of two of the big ones. But the reason that, you know, a kind of regulatory story such as this one is in our magazine is because it does have an impact on enthusiasts. A lot of the cars that we really want um, from, from Europe we can't get because they have such different safety standards. Um, we, for example, do a seat belt test without an occupant belted. So right. uh, it, it becomes, you know, there's hundreds of examples like that in the rules that prevent one car from moving over. And, uh, right, and it could, it could ease the job for the automakers too, and that, you know, rather than building, you know, an, an inner door panel or, you know, that kind of sub skin crash structure for the U.S. and having a different one for, the, for Europe or having one overbuilt here so that it meets this standard, you know, that kind of thing. It, if potentially anyways, it, you could do, see it do away with all of that and all of us have one set of regulations that our cars are built to. And I think even that, that certification element keeps a lot of cool stuff out of the U.S. And if, right. if they can align that, uh, you know, I, we hear all the time, Ford or Volkswagen has this really cool engine in this car in Europe, why isn't it here in the US? And the cost of certifying that engine, even if it does meet emissions requirements, is extravagant for the automaker. And if they're only gonna sell 10,000 units per year of a diesel model, it might not be worth it financially for them. But if the uh, requirements are the same and by doing one certification process, they actually get both European and American markets we could see a lot more powertrain variants in the cars we already have here. And it's really to automakers' advantage as far as I'm concerned because some of these kind of halo cars are not coming from the traditional places anymore. It's not just the high horsepower atomic wedge kind of supercars that are halo cars. For a lot of enthusiasts, it's a diesel wagon with a stick. You know, it's, um, it's a different sort of car that speaks to the enthusiast, I think, of our generation. Yeah, um, so it's, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. So we're excited about that. Mm -hmm. um, what else is in, in your section? Uh, we've, we've got some... I know, some, but I'm just trying <laughs> yeah. to prompt we've, you. We've got some lighter stuff in this month, too. Uh, we got, I'm sure you've all seen the Buick commercials with Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, and the lacrosse. And uh, we saw that, and we thought, well, now, I don't... You know, I'm not so sure they actually did that, or if, they, if it was a stock car. And actually, it was funny, if you, if you looked on YouTube, a lot of the commentary was also, I mean just pages of people going, they modified the car, they moved the seat, they did this, they did that. So uh, we tracked down a seven foot tall shack lookalike, uh, which is no easy task, by the way. Uh, it turns out there's not a lot of people seven feet tall in the US or in the world. And there's no way nobody my size can fit into this car. Incredible uh, facsimile of Shaquille O'Neal for this thing. And uh, we put him in the lacrosse and Mm -hmm. This is actually one of my favorite stories because we deployed as much kind of testing rigor to this as we do to our normal tests and it was just totally absurd and I loved it. Um, we also have in this issue, which I should show because it's a cool cover with a cutaway of the 918, we have another Porsche in this issue, uh, the Cayman. We did a road test on the Cayman S uh, when Casey was in Germany. But we got the car to drive here and I don't know about you guys, I totally fell in love with this thing. I thought it was, in one sense, completely evolutionary, in another, completely revolutionary. I've never been in a car 
that rebounded out of corners as quickly, that had this kind of body control that was almost seamless and telepathic. And it was just, to me, a, a new level of vehicle dynamics. Yeah. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be on the launch for the Cayman in Portugal and uh, drove the car from first thing in the morning until they forced us to go to dinner that night. And uh, I found one stretch of road that was maybe only 10 miles long, but I took every variant I could get my hands on, the manual, the PDK, the S, the base Cayman, back to that 10 mile stretch of road, just because for me, that's what this job is all about is the best cars on the best roads and this that absolutely qualified as one of those moments you know we're, we're sort of known at car and driver for our testing and our, our uh, instrumented tests but this is a car that is not the fastest it posts you know great braking numbers it posts incredible skid pad numbers and great slalom figures but these are all numbers really associated or trying to quantify its yeah. handling um, and so it's not the most powerful but but the handling um, kind of delta that this thing has with everything else is just totally shocking. Uh, it's a mid-engine car, but it's totally progressive the way it breaks out. It's electrically assisted steering, but all that does is serve to filter out all, kind of, all the road noise and everything else just seems like pure signal. And there's just something really magical and special about this car um, that gets to the fact that, okay, you know, if you look at it, all the performance metrics are kind of converging, zero to 60 time, braking, and all that. So what becomes important, I think, is the personality of the car, the design, the feel, some of the heritage. That's all in this Cayman S, you know? It's sort of like everything Porsche knows in this car. And they purposely kind of neuter it a little bit so it doesn't uh, kind of eclipse the 911. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the 911, certainly has the advantage in the numbers, right? right. You, you mentioned that uh, this car isn't necessarily about pure numbers. And in that respect, I think the Cayman is really starting to encroach on the 911. If you look at it from the subjective sense, from the driver's seat, if you jump back and forth between the two cars, I really love the Cayman. And uh, I think Porsche is, may, Porsche is maybe giving it a little room to, uh, to climb the ladder. It'll be interesting to see how they develop it. And Casey makes the point in the review that, you know, this, this car is, I mean, it's realizing what Porsche has been working toward all along, but it's really, the bigger thing there is that, like you said, revolutionary. I mean, it's, it's a realization of what the 911 has, you know, what they wanted the 911 to be all along. And, it, you know, now we get that in the Cayman. And so, yeah, you are, they are sort of intentionally Pampering the car to keep it from dethroning their flagship. Right. It's the world's most flexible, comfortable, pure sports car. Another road test in this issue is of the Land Rover Range Rover Supercharged. And this vehicle, um, in the past, you know, we've always loved it, but not because of the way it handled. <laughs> you know, it was almost kind of non vehicular. There was a, a sense that, you know, it was just a great piece of furniture with four wheels. This one's a little bit different. This one, I think, is dynamically a lot more engaging. You know, they took a lot of weight out. We found probably not as much weight as they claim. They were claiming anywhere from 800 to 1,000 pounds. We said it's probably more like 325. Um, but what, what were your reactions when you, when you uh, drove the thing when it was here? Yeah, I, I agree with you in that the old Range Rover we loved, not because of, of how it handled, really, but it just had a sense of occasion about it. And I mean, incredible craftsmanship inside and really just great presence out there on the road. Uh, this car starts to finally feel like it belongs on the road and, um, you know, kind of makes some strides getting closer to maybe what a Porsche Cayenne is. It, uh -huh. it uh, doesn't really hamper itself in terms of off-road heritage anymore. It's, it's finally kind of coming around to being something that you can drive on the road and, and not make excuses for it because it actually does behave very nicely on the road. Well, and they kind of had to do that. You know, when you, when you look at competitors, you know, the Cayenne, you're getting maybe not that Range Rover level of off-road ability, but they have so far surpassed it in terms of, you know, daily drivability, you know, freeway behavior and that sort of thing that 
they you know they had they did they had to evolve in, uh, if they ever wanted to become more than just a small niche novelty manufacturer. And that yeah, you're right. I mean that's that's what they've done with this. The thing that's still incredible to me about Range Rover is it has these kind of hidden functional cues that you don't realize are there until you go off-roading with the thing. You know, they have these little capitals on the hood that really show you where the car stops, where the vehicle stops. The high H point is so you can look down over the door and see where you are when you're off-roading. And these things are still really incredible off-road and they're sized for off-road. And uh, I don't think the aluminum uh, space frame diminishes that at all. I haven't no. gone off-roading with it. But I think it's a great, if expensive, compromise to get this thing up to, as you said, like, you know, the standards mm -hmm. of the class. Because people have come to the realization that you know, while the off-road ability is great, it's kind of a perceived performance thing. It's, it's a heritage cue, in a way. Right. It's something that, oh, I know it can do this. And maybe if I go to the Greenbrier as part of some package I won for my Land Rover dealer, I'll get to see how this thing really performs. And, and that's, I think, what helps to sell the car, as we were talking about earlier. But it has to function in traffic, and this one does much, much better. Let's get into the section that you edited this month, which is the Tech 50. And uh, it's this big, sprawling package about everything that's going on, kind of on the technical side of the automobile business. And there's great interviews in there. There's a lot of great stuff uh, happening you know, on the software side, the hardware side. And we just kind of gathered it all up, and you did a fantastic job, I think, of pulling this thing together, and it looks great. Yeah, so we anchored the package with uh, a handful of stories, and one of those was the Porsche 918 Spyder, 800-plus uh, horsepower, plug-in hybrid supercar. This thing is, is the future. Other things were we also had that plug-in hybrid comparison, and we did a big feature on autonomous cars, autonomous driving, the, the future that's coming maybe 10, 20, maybe as far as 30 years down the road. It might not be as close as we think. That was a really interesting piece, and I think it was kind of the definitive piece on uh, the autonomous car because it debunked a lot of the myths. I think people think that we're just hurtling toward inexorably this automated future where everything is, you know, you know, take your hands off the wheel, it's the highway of the future, you know, like in those old uh, GM uh, movies from the 50s where it was like the intelligent highway. We've been talking about it for so long and now all these technologies, radar-based technologies, camera-based technologies are front-loaded into the cars and the capability is there but it's turning that switch that is kind of I think the hurdle and it's going to take a very very long time and personally I'm glad it's going to take a long time. <laughs> there are people quoted in the piece that say Okay, here's the thing. The car, yeah, it can do, um, it can keep itself between the lanes, it can keep itself away from other cars, it can do all this stuff in a limited way. But computers are only as good as the stuff you put into them, the information you give them. And there's no possible way that a car can have the kind of reactive intelligence that a human has. Like when a pedestrian's walking across the street, we're looking at their face, we're looking at their body language, we're trying to, you know, create a picture for ourselves of what to do and how to react and all this happens non-consciously. The car is just not there yet. It's not going to be there for a long time. I thought that was a key, key point of this piece and Zach Rosenberg did a great job with it. I think another key, uh, another huge hurdle for autonomous cars is the technology is, is almost there and I'd say within five years it will be 98% there. Uh, the, the final 2% will be incredibly hard to get. But the and great, that's also, that's where the big problem comes that's in. That's where the big problem is, but the great hurdle is really kind of this legislative right. obstacle and this social obstacle of how will people accept these and how will they be, how tolerant will they be of computers making mistakes? Humans make thousands of mistakes on the road every day, tens of thousands right. of mistakes on the road every day. But how many will it take for a computer for people to really start calling into question cars. And I think the number's lower than what humans That's do. The really, tolerance really is really point. low. That's a really good point. And that legislative point is really interesting, you know? And, and think about insurance. You know, you're gonna have cars that are capable one day of driving themselves. But what about somebody who wants to drive? How much is that gonna cost? Because, they're, you know, they will, if cars are, are, you know, safe to a level beyond 
human safety, what exists now or what exists at the peak. Um, and they start taking some of these um, structural elements out of the car that we need now for safety. If they take airbags out of the car, which maybe they will, maybe they won't. If the cars become less safe kind of structurally because there's a higher degree of safety baked into the intelligence systems in the car, how much is it going to cost for you or I to drive one ourselves? That's a scary thing. And, you know, I hopefully I'll be dead before that. <laughs> Before oh, know about that. one other thing we got into the tech package, um, it's not just cars necessarily, it's, it's how cars are made, right? Yeah. And so 3D printing we can get into, and the, 3D printing is all the rage. You hear about it in newspapers, you read about it on CNN's website, all that stuff. But uh, this is a throttle body that we had printed here in Michigan. They did this for us. Um, obviously, they had the CAD files on hand. And right now, you might use this just for... Uh, mocking up a car, checking fit and everything inside an engine bay. You might use it to create the mold that will then be used when you're actually casting these as metal pieces. But there's another idea of the future where these 3D printers might actually be doing production work and they could work fast, they could be working fast enough and you could have enough of them that you'd actually have printers doing one specific machine, a whole warehouse or one specific part, a full warehouse of these um, and it really does change how you make the car because you put material precisely where, where you want needed. it right and nowhere else so in a metal cast piece this might have uh, a solid component that in a 3d printed piece is actually hollow yeah it's lighter and, uh, it's stronger and we're getting closer to my idea which is the replicator from star trek you know <laughs> You can order up, uh, I don't know, a Porsche 2.7 RS. <laughs> that would be good. Anybody so who no wants more, one. There are no more rare parts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. No, I, I think that's really, really cool stuff. And we're right at the beginning of all of this. Uh, and I think the applications for, for um, car making can be really, really profound. And that was a really cool piece. I enjoyed that. But one other element in the tech package that I just get really geeked about. It's more computers than cars, but McLaren, the way they're developing cars, and they're, they do it so differently than everybody because they're new to the game, they're a small company, and they have so much experience with racing. And so when they develop the 12C, they turn to their Formula One computer simulator. And it features a F1 tub sitting on hydraulic rams with a 180 degree computer screen in front of you and the driver sits there and navigates uh, a road course and can you know practice his racing line but when you turn to developing a production car there is uh, so much detail in this computer model that they're starting to tune ride and handling ride quality from a computer without putting a car on the road without the actual springs and shocks that will be bolted to the car and i just think that's so incredible that the technology the simulation is that advanced that we can develop cars in that way. That is very cool. And Tesla gets all this credit for being the car company of the future. Yeah. We like to think it's McLaren. Yeah. And I, I mean, the advantage to consumers here, to, to our readers, is that you get better cars that have more testing time into them yeah. because there's less time in there spent swapping components waiting for somebody to tool up or waiting for somebody to ship the springs over, right? It's all about time spent tuning. It yeah. really is. And uh, so, you know, you get better cars and you get them faster from development to actually hitting the road. Absolutely. So that's it for the uh, August issue, but there's lots more in here. It's been Eddie Alterman, Eric Tingwell, and Jared Gall sitting on some tires for Car and Driver.